Thanks for coming from the Keys. Yep. So our topic of conversation here tonight, obviously, is tilefish. That's why you're all here. Who likes catching tilefish? Okay. Who wants to catch more tilefish? Right? If you didn't raise your hand, why are you here? Okay. We all do, right? So in, prep, in preparing for this seminar, I really got to thinking, you know, and I thought to myself, how am I going to explain everything that I would like to about two different species, blue line tilefish and golden tilefish, very similar in a lot of ways, but also very different in a lot of ways. How am I going to explain everything that there is about these two species, you know, here in southeast Florida, the Florida Keys, where we're located now, Gulf of Mexico, where tilefish are very popular, and talk about all of these tackle and techniques and everything involved in such a short period of time. And I really believe that it would be probably impossible to do that. So I've decided to take a little bit of a different approach with this seminar, and we're going to take you on a little journey. I want to share with you my lifetime experience with tilefish. And somewhere along the line, in sharing everything over the last 25 years targeting these fish, I'm hoping that you'll pick up some tips and tricks and things that'll help you in your quest to catch more tiles. Because really, look, at the end of the day, we all have different boats, we all have different tackle, we all live in a different place, have different schedules, and there's not one perfect system or scenario that works for everybody, right? You know, everybody is different. So again, somewhere throughout all of this, I'm certain you'll be able to pick up some fundamental tips that'll really help you be a more successful angler. Please hold your questions till the end because there's a lot of info that I'd like to share in a short period of time. And at the end, we're going to do a raffle and then I'm going to remain up here and answer whatever questions that you have. Certainly, you can come up and take a closer look at the tackle as well. So let's get started here. Many, many years ago, and I'm 52 now, so close to 30 years ago up in New Jersey, I worked on a bunch of boats. And one of the things that we did a lot of was canyon tuna fishing. We would go out to the Hudson Canyon, Linden Cole Canyon, all of these canyons up there and fish for yellow fins and blue fins and big eyes, swordfish, all kinds of cool stuff. And our schedule, my schedule as a mate on the boat at that time, before I eventually got my 100 ton captain's license and was up in the wheelhouse, as a mate, I had a crazy schedule, six hours on, two hours off, whatever it was. You know, we fished out there for two days at a time. But I found that every time I got a break, rather than sleeping, and you know, of course, as a teenager or 20s, whatever it was, you're just full of energy, I decided I wanted to fish the bottom for tile fish. I didn't want to take my free time and sleep or fish for tuna with everybody else on the boat, but I wanted to do something a little bit different. And of course, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, 35 years ago, oh my God, okay? We didn't have any of this fancy schmancy electronic stuff. You know what I had? I had a 6-0, a Penn Senator 6-0. Everybody know what a 6-0 is? Okay, I had a Penn Senator 6-0 loaded with 80 pound monofilament. That's what I had. I had absolutely no idea how deep the water was. We were out there in the canyon anchored up. I don't know, it was somewhere between 700 and 1,500 feet. You know, again, I don't know. I wasn't asking the guys in the wheelhouse. I was just fishing. And I would hook up a high-low rig, two hooks, with the heaviest weight that I could find on the boat. Usually it was a combination of leads that I tied together. And I'd drop it straight to the bottom. And again, I don't know how deep it was. All I know is at some point, boom, the lead hit the bottom. And I would catch golden tile fish. Okay, not big ones. They were probably five to eight pounds in that range. And we would pick away at these golden tile fish. We were anchored up, fishing very deep water. And I found it just absolutely fascinating that these beautiful fish, because they truly are beautiful, the golden tile fish with their golden dots, and they've got some blue on them and the yellows, one of the prettiest fish in the ocean, no doubt about that. And of course, on the dinner table, well look, they don't call them poor man's lobster for nothing, right? It is literally, in my opinion, the best eating fish in the ocean. Okay. So, you know, I really found it fascinating that we were able to catch these great fish 
and I picked away at the golden tile fish. And that's where my tile fishing pursuit, career, whatever you want to call it, really started. I was a kid at the time, you know, working on a boat, working hard. I never really thought about anything other than the fact that I'm dropping this bait to the bottom and I'm catching these fish. I didn't think about where they live, how they live, you know, where they migrate or don't migrate. None of the science behind it meant anything. And nobody was really doing it. Okay, nobody up there was tile fishing because everybody was focused, of course, on the tuna fishing out in the canyons and nobody had the gear that we have today. And I stress that because some of the equipment that we have today has absolutely changed the game. You know, the, the one thing in particular, braid. Braid. Braid is the slice, you know, like sliced bread of fishing. It literally has changed everything. Well, we didn't have that back then. And it's probably a good thing we didn't. We probably would have sunk the boat with the amount of tuna we could have caught if we had today's technology. Nevertheless, I fished up there for many years and ultimately moved down here to South Florida and ended up right here in Pompano in the early 90s. As I started fishing here locally, I wasn't catching much because I really didn't know much about the fisheries here. Uh, but I knew a lot about bottom fishing and ultimately got a boat and ultimately got an electric reel, okay? A big uh, crystal XL651 or whatever that number is, you know, this big, heavy, bulky electric reel on a short, stiff rod. Okay, it was like a pool cue, but it was the first electric reel that I had, had probably 130 pound Dacron or some kind of string loaded on the reel. And I decided to explore the depths out here because we have very deep water close to shore. Up in the Northeast, you'd have to travel 100 miles to get to 1,000 feet of water. Here, we're in 1,000 feet of water in 10 miles. And there's certainly deeper water, obvious, or deep water substantially closer. So I decided to start really searching this bottom, just you know, looking for action, not knowing what I was going to find. And really back then, look, I didn't have Seymour. Forget it. We have, you guys familiar with Seymour, right? You're familiar with today's technology, these fancy schmancy chart plotters. And we've got so much technology at our fingertips nowadays. It's just a huge advantage. We didn't have, you ready for it? The internet? Okay, you couldn't just get on Google and say, hey, where do I go catch tile fish? Or what's caught on the bottom over here? There was, we didn't have that. So you literally whipped out a paper chart and you studied that chart and you looked at that paper chart and you said, where are these drop-offs and where's this, you know, depth contours and what might be out here? But really, there's no chart and there's no technology that'll tell you where exactly the fish are, right? The only way to know that is to get out there and do it, to, you know, invest the time and the energy. And that's what I did. So I'd go out here with this big crystal and I'd have one of these typical deep drop rigs, five hooks, all of this schmeckla, you know, glow squids and glow beads and all of this stuff on this five hook rig with like a 10 pound lead. And I figured, well, there's one way to find fish. I'll just go out here to 400 feet, drop to the bottom and do a drift for an hour. If I don't get a bite, then I'll just go out to 450 feet and do the same thing. And then 500 feet. And basically I created a grid and I just worked my way all the way out, worked my way north, worked my way south from Fort Lauderdale to up toward Palm Beach, and I spent a tremendous amount of time grid patterning, so to, patterning, so to speak, the bottom. And along the way, I caught tile fish, okay? Especially in one particular zone between 450 and 600 feet. However, they were not golden tile fish. There were another species of tile fish called blue line tile fish. And they were almost everywhere. Almost every time I dropped, it would be rare where we didn't get bit. And understand that back then here in state waters, because that 450 is within three miles of the coast. It's right on that border. The limit for blue line tile fish was 100 pounds. Okay, 100 pounds. Of course, that's not the limit today. It's three fish out in federal waters, but back then you could have up to 100 pounds. So we would come back on many occasions with 100 pounds of tile fish. They were all anywhere from two 
to six pounds in that range, average size blue line tile fish. And we'd go out and we would just absolutely wreck them and keep researching and researching and researching with this one big heavy rod and reel, which was connected with alligator clips to a 12 volt car battery that I would bring and you know charge up and put on the deck. And that was the beginning of my deep dropping here. And I never found any golden tile fish. I never found any groupers or anything else. All I caught were these cute little blue line tile fish. However, eventually I reached a point as the years tick by, I said, you know, this just isn't that much fun with this big rod. This is like a tow truck almost. So of course, as technology continued to advance over the years, as I continued to mature, eventually launching Florida Sport Fishing Magazine, eventually getting my hands on lighter, more sensitive tackle, braid entered the equation, and I kept scaling down, going smaller, lighter, smaller, lighter, because I wanted to make it as sporty as I possibly could. And eventually I got to a point where I said, you know, the right way to catch these things is with basic conventional tackle. It's not with electric rods and reels if you're looking for the greatest sport. It's with basically a 30 to 50 pound class, seven or eight foot conventional rod with 30 pound braid, a 20 ounce bank sinker, and a two or three hook rig with 5.0 VMC inline circle hooks. And that was my rig. And I would go out there and do it manually by hand because now we could fish three or four people and everybody could fish manually. Whereas previously, we only had this one bulky rod and reel, which had no sport to it whatsoever. It's not like you were taking that crystal reel out of the rod holder and holding it. Then weighed 138 pounds. Okay, you weren't moving it. Once it was there, it was there. And it's not like the rod doubled over. It wasn't some super carbon fiber, graphite, torre fiber, you know, no. It was like fiberglass, like real, real, just fiberglass and really, really stiff. So like I said, just wasn't sporty. So over the years, it evolved into manual fishing, okay, manual fishing for these tiles to a point where we started ultimately filming some television shows on catching these gray tiles. And there were a lot a lot of them. It was a very, very abundant fishery. It was something where you could count on it. There are no guarantees in fishing, but I can promise you in like the year 2002, three, four, I guarantee you if you went out here from four to 600 feet and dropped some squid to the bottom, you're going to get bit by tile fish. Okay. It got to the point where we really wanted to learn even more about these. So we started dropping cameras to the bottom. We've got GoPro cameras were introduced, and we fixed a GoPro camera into a housing, okay, a hooker electric GoPro camera housing, and we would drop it to the bottom, has a very bright light mounted in the housing, and we would drop this thing to the bottom because I wanted to learn more and more about these blue line tile fish. You know, what's the habitat like? I suspected that they lived in the mud because all tile fish typically live in the mud, so that's what I believed. And what I saw was both absolutely fascinating and absolutely disgusting. I saw two things that really, you know, excited me and turned my stomach. What excited me is every time we would drop that rig to the bottom and we would drift, we would drift. We'd go out Hillsborough Inlet. I'm being straight with you, telling you exactly what we did. We'd go out, like I said, 400, 450, 475, 500, 525 in that range. And we would drift north, at, or usually. Okay? And every time we dropped that camera down, of course, we weren't able to see the footage at that moment because we didn't have the technology that we have today. So we'd have to go back to the office and upload the, you know, the footage. And I'd watch on the screen. And all you would see is, of course, the light that's you know, almost like a flashlight, essentially, pointing to the bottom. And you would see these tile fish enter that orb of light, almost like rats. They would just come running in. They would pick at the bait. You'd hook some, and some would just dart back out. It was fascinating. Just watching their behavior. And not one, 
Rarely did you ever see one. It was always multiple. Here comes one, here comes another one. Like I said, it was like a, like a swarm of rats. That's what I refer to them like. And that was really exciting. What was really disgusting is what I also saw. Every few seconds, a bottle, a tire, trash, trash. There's so much trash out here on the bottom that it is disgusting. Okay? And that bothered me. It bothered me back then, and it still bothers me today. And it, that, of course, doesn't change anything that we're doing, but I point that out because that's something that has stuck with me you know, over the years is that footage of seeing what the bottom really looks like out here. But what else I saw was the burrows that these tilefish dug. Okay? And these blue line tilefish, they would dig into the bottom, and they create, we'll call it a pothole. Okay, almost a conical-shaped pothole, and that was their home. That's where they lived. And the more that I researched and the more that I studied these blue line tile fish, the more adept that I got at catching them, at targeting them and catching them, and the more successful, you know, and we shared a lot of that. We shared a lot of it on TV. We shared a lot of it in, in our magazine at the time. I was just more and more fascinated with how they built these burrows where they lived almost their entire lives. The tilefish don't migrate. They don't leave here. You know, they're here, these blue line tilefish. They're here year round. Okay? And once they dig that burrow, they typically stay in that burrow for most of their lives, if not their entire life. Because if they run too far away from the burrow, guess what happens? The next guy moves in. Okay? squatter's rights, right? So in turn, that explained why when we dropped the light down that they would come in, they would pick at the bait, they would like, you know, try and eat it, eat it, and then they would dart off. And I'd say to myself, why in the world would a fish that's eating a bait suddenly leave? Well, the boat's drifting. The rig is drifting further and further away from its burrow. And that fish knows that's my whole world revolves around that pothole right there because not only is it my home, but within that pothole are smaller potholes and smaller, you know, uh, depressions that crabs and other sorts of forage species because it's structure, right? So if you have a flat area and suddenly you have a burrow or a pothole, it's structure. And that structure is going to attract bait. And that could very well be one of the reasons they dig those burrows. It's almost like a mouse trap. You know, they dig it to attract bait to come to the burrow where they eat that bait. But it was absolutely fascinating, you know, really seeing their behavior. Most of the fish, as I mentioned, were two. If you caught one that was an honest, an honest, five pounds. That's a pretty big blue line tile fish for here. Okay? And over the years, that fishery diminished rapidly. I don't know why. I mean, certainly more and more. Well, I, I don't want to say I don't know why. Technology, your why. Because now suddenly Dio introduced the Tanacoms and other electric reels were introduced, better technology, and more and more people started to take advantage of this readily available resource because if you go out here on a Saturday to try and fish the edge with 9,000 other boats fishing the same area, it can be challenging. And if you're not finding what you're looking for, you at least want to come home with some dinner. So it's almost like everybody nowadays carries a deep drop rod. And I think more and more people started to take advantage of this fishery. And remember what I said earlier, they don't migrate. So you could have a large area, and there could be a colony of tilefish in that area, because they generally will live in a colony. Okay? Very rarely will there be just one. It's a colony, because the habitat is ideal for their behavior. So there's typically a colony. Well, it's easy to wipe out that colony. It really is, and I believe that over the years, that's exactly what's happened. I know that up until... Three years ago, when I moved down to Marathon in the Florida Keys, I was still tile fishing for the gray tile fish here, and I would struggle. I really would. There was days where if we caught half a dozen throughout the whole day, I was happy. When in the past, like I said, catching dozens and dozens and dozens was just normal, but it's become more and more challenging. 
It eventually reached a point up here where I wanted to now take the whole sport of catching these blue line tile fish to another level. And instead of even fishing a conventional outfit with squid, which by the way, squid is the staple bait for the blue line tile fish. Okay, there's no better bait that you could use for these blue lines than squid. It has a lot of odor. They hunt not only by sight, but certainly by smell. So they could smell that bait. It's easy for them to eat, to suck down. They don't have a huge mouth relative to the size of their body. It's not like a grouper. A grouper can suck down a watermelon. A big blue line tile fish or a small blue line tile fish, he's got a small mouth, very small. So the squid is an ideal bait, okay? However, again, we wanted to take it to the next level, so we started to jig these fish using slow pitch jigs, which allowed us a very thin braid, 30 pound braid, which allowed us to drop down to the bottom, jig within five feet, 10 feet of the bottom, because again, remember what I said, their burrows are their life, but so is the bottom. A tile fish relates to the bottom, his entire world, revolves around the ocean floor, sea floor, okay? He is not a midwater predator. It is not like a snapper that will roam higher up off the bottom. Absolutely not. We saw it visually. We watched it. They would come up a few feet, and there's no way. I've never seen a tile fish swim more than 10 feet off the bottom without immediately turning around and swimming right back down to the bottom because their whole life revolves around that bottom. That's also why, if you ask me, we ball, who's deep dropped in the Bahamas? Okay, handful of people. I've deep dropped in the Bahamas, I can't tell you how many times. You know how many tile fish I've ever caught deep dropping in the Bahamas? Zero. Absolutely zero. None. Has anybody caught a tile fish deep dropping in the Bahamas? That's not, not only is it not their habitat, but I believe, it is my opinion, that these blue line tile fish because they relate to the bottom, that means they need to hug the bottom, right? To swim all the way across the Gulf Stream. Well, if you have the Gulf Stream pushing at three to five knots and dropping thousands of feet, it's just too much. It's just not the right scenario for these blue line tiles. So they don't cross that way. They don't go there. You can find blue line tile fish all the way up the Eastern seaboard. You can find them certainly here all around the Keys and throughout the Gulf of Mexico, but I've never found them in the Bahamas, ever. So anyhow, I got into jigging, and I would go out here, the same depths, because I knew where the tile fish were, and I would jig the fish. But lo and behold, in between catching all of these blue line tile fish on the jigs, which by the way, they respond very well to slow pitch jigs here, okay, in that 375, 400 on the shallow side to 550, 575 on the deep side. That's their, we'll call it their avenue. They respond really well to jigs. But interestingly, mixed in with all of the tile fish, guess what else ate the jigs? Anybody want to take a stab? Blackfin tuna, okay, surprisingly. And it eventually reached a point where I was jigging more blackfin tuna than tile fish. And I thought to myself, well, what in the world are the blackfin tuna doing in the bottom 500 feet in the middle of the day? They're eating squid. Of course, what else would they be doing? A blackfin tuna, we've caught blackfin tunas 1,100 feet down, deep dropping. So that's incredible fish. And it's just something to remember on the side that when you're out here looking for the blue line tile fish, if you do want to jig, expect to encounter some blackfin tuna mixed in with the blue lines as well. However, as that fishery started to dissipate and simultaneously my skill level continued to advance, my arsenal continued to advance, and one day I had an epiphany and said, you know, why am I targeting these two to six pound blue line tile fish? There's gotta be golden tile fish here too. And now the golden tile fish is the premier tile fish. He's the big cousin to the blue line. A blue line tile fish will live 15 to 16 years at the most, will typically reach your average fish, as I mentioned here, 
two to six pounds, but we're going to talk about some much bigger ones in a couple of minutes, but two to six pounds. But whereas a golden tilefish will reach 50 pounds, right? They're just beautiful, but they're nowhere near as abundant. But I wanted to take everything that I've learned with the blue line tilefish and push it further and start to look for the golden tilefish. And understand, I'm talking about two decades, okay? I'm summing up two decades in a short period of time fishing right here at a Hillsborough Inlet. Well, I realized that the golden tilefish and doing all of my research is a much deeper tilefish, right? The golden tilefish prefers a bottom habitat that is in that 700 to 1200 foot range. The blue line tilefish, the smaller ones, 400 to 700. The big goldens, 700 to 1200. I've never, never on the same trip caught both in the same area. Even though their territory and their habitat cross each other in a small area, I've never had them both on the same day. I'm not saying it's not possible, I'm just saying I never have. And I fish for them differently. For the blue line tile fish up here, we do fish the smaller hooks, anywhere from a 3.0 to a 5.0 because they are smaller, they have a smaller mouth, and if you fish anything larger than a 5.0, you're gonna miss a lot of those fish. And by the way, when it comes to lead, when you're targeting these blue line tile fish here, as I mentioned, conventional outfit, if you're gonna fish manually, 20 ounce bank sinker is perfect. If you're gonna deep drop with any sort of electric equipment, two pounds, three pounds at the very most. If you've got a fish more than three pounds, there's way too much current and you're likely not gonna get on those fish. So don't, don't get in that mindset of thinking that you need to fish these eight, 10, 12 pound leads for tile fish because you don't, okay? We use those big heavy sash weights for sword fishing, not tile fishing. So in my research and in my search for golden tile fish, I thought the same thing. Let me go out and do a grid pattern. Let me go out, fish bigger baits, bigger tackle, and essentially do the same thing that I did with the blue line tile fish for the goldens. So I went out here and every drop, you know what I encountered out there between 800 and 1,000 feet? Rosies, these funny little red things, okay? With all these spines think coming up and I'm like, what in the heck is this thing, right? And again, in doing my research, it is a member of the scorpion fish family called the black belly rose fish. Some people called it a rose grouper or something or, or a black belly grouper, you know, a lot of different names for them. They're everywhere out there. Again, small, one to three pounds. If there's any structure whatsoever, you're gonna catch the black bellies and you're gonna catch a lot of them. I don't even think there's a limit on them. It is an absolutely delicious fish, by the way. It's great for ceviche. It's a fun fish to catch because it's typically very plentiful. So you get a lot of action. But the problem with the black belly rose fish, if this could be a problem, is there's too many of them. So when you're targeting the golden tile fish, you can't get past the black belly rose fish because every bait that you get to the bottom gets eaten by a black belly rose fish. So, it's very hard to find and fool the goldens. Nevertheless, if you put in enough time in between all of those black belly rose fish, you will pick the occasional golden tile fish. And we did, and that's how we fished for years. And you know, using typically five pounds of lead, a little bit of a bigger rig, five hooks, you know, 7.0 to 9.0 size. And again, anywhere out here, look, if you want to catch black belly rose fish, go straight out Hillsborough or Boca Inlet, stop at 800 feet, drop your rig to the bottom. You're going to catch black belly rose fish. You do it enough times, you're going to catch a golden here and there, here and there as well, okay? But mostly the black bellies. Well, one day in filming one of our television series, and by the way, I'm not sure if you know this, but when we film a 30 minute show, we fish for two days. So if anybody thinks that you go out there with a camcorder and you film for 30 minutes and you have a show, that's not the reality of reality TV, okay? We fish hard for two days. So the first day, looking for golden tilefish, that's what this episode was about. We didn't get any bites. We didn't catch any. 
So now I'm home that evening, you know, strategizing and thinking about what I'm going to do the next day to try and find these fish. And I'm studying my chart plotter. You know, no, no more paper charts now, right? I'm literally on the boat. I'm scrolling on my Furuno. I can look at the bottom. I've got fishing charts. I can, you know, really, really cool. I could pick spots while I'm at the dock. I don't need to wait until I'm out there. I don't want to, you know, waste valuable time. I want to have all of my spots lined up before I get out there. So, and I can do that right at the dock by, scroll, you know, by scrolling and creating waypoints. And I find this area that's about a mile and a half wide by three miles long. And it is just a very, very flat plateau. Very, very flat. There's no structure whatsoever. And understand, when you're looking at a fishing chart that has contour lines, the further apart those contour lines are, the flatter an area is. When you see those contour lines come close together, that's either a depression or an up, you know, it's either a hill or a depression, it's something steep. So you want to look for flat bottom when it comes to golden tilefish because they dig the burrows in the mud just like their little cousins, the blue line tilefish. However, it's a much larger burrow, up to 12 feet across. So imagine a pothole 12 feet across, four or five feet deep. You know, that's what that fish is digging and digging. That's its home. However, this one area was in between where we typically fished. And I thought to myself, wait a minute, are you telling me that I've been running over this area to fish out there when in reality they're over there, inshore of where I am? So the second day, we started offshore where we typically do and didn't get any bites. And an hour into it, I said, reel them up. We're going to make a move. And I got a hunch. And fortunately, that hunch paid off. And I found a colony of them. And we just wrecked them. Now understand, you're allowed three golden tilefish per boat. One per person, three per boat. So depending on how many people you have on your boat, it doesn't matter. As long as you have three or more people, you're allowed three. Right? No more than that. Just keep that in mind. So nevertheless, every bait that hit the bottom, the rod just went whoop, doubled over. And we caught these beautiful big golden tilefish. That area out here starts in approximately 825 feet and will run to approximately 860 feet. And it is... I tell you all of this because I'm not fishing here anymore. I'm not. So I don't care if you go out there and catch them all. I want you to catch them all. Okay? I want to be your hero. So I'm going to tell you exactly where they are, short of giving you GPS numbers. Simply because giving you a GPS number isn't going to make a difference anyway. You're drifting. You're moving. So just get out here, put in the time, put in the work, drop down to the bottom, and you're going to find them. Okay? Now understand, like with other fisheries, the pressure has increased over the years, right? With, again, tackle, technology. Guys are now going out jigging these fish. So, you know, how many of them are still left out here? I don't know, but I know that it's enough for you to definitely try. I know that in the Gulf of Mexico, we go out there, way out to areas like Pulley Ridge, uh, Rankin Ridge. We deep drop out there where 99% of the tile fish that you catch out there let me rephrase it, 99.9% .9 of the tilefish that you catch way out in the Gulf are the blue line tilefish, but every now and then you catch a golden out there. But the population is of blue lines is very healthy out in the Gulf of Mexico. The population of goldens might be relatively healthy as well. They're just not as abundant. It's a different species. They're just not as abundant. But getting back to here, what we also learned was tackle. Of course, like with all other fisheries, makes a very big difference. And trust me when I tell you, I went through everything. I went through that crystal. I ultimately started fishing the LPs. You know, I tried a lot of different stuff. I tried the manual, but forget that. You're talking about 850 feet, five pounds of lead. I don't care who you think you are. Do not tell me that you're going to drop a five pound lead to the bottom with a three hook rig and crank all day long, every time you need to go up for another drift, or it's just not going to happen. 
Okay, so you have to use the power assist equipment. Fortunately, power assist equipment has come such a long way. You know, we can now fish gear that is so light compared to the heavy, bulky equipment that we were fishing in the past. And that makes it much sportier because no longer are we deep dropping with the rod in a rod holder and just waiting for that rod tip to bounce. On the contrary, when you deep drop with me, this rod is under your arm the entire time. Okay, the only time the rod is in the rod holder is if you're just reeling up your bait to check your bait or we're going up for another drift. There's no reason to hold that rod. You can put in a rod holder, step on the gas, and bring that, reel, bring that rig all the way up. But when you are fishing, actively fishing, the rod is in your hand the entire time. It's very, very light. The only reason there's a bent butt, as I mentioned, when you're bringing it up, it makes it much more convenient and much more effective to have a bent butt outfit when you're just reeling up or fishing out of a rod holder. When it's under your arm, the bent butt really doesn't make a big difference. We're fishing much lighter line. You see I have two different outfits here. Both of them are equipped with a Shimano Beastmaster 9000. This has evolved in my opinion, to be the ultimate power assist deep drop reel. I can crank if I would like to, so, and there's a lot of times where we do, where we'll use that handle. And unlike the Daiwa Tanacoms that have a retrieve ratio of like one to one, where it takes you like three days to reel up if you turn a handle, this is much more like your conventional reel. This is probably, I don't know off the top of my head, but if I had to guess, somewhere close to four to one. So it's a relatively fast reel. It's fun to fish manually. And of course, you also have the power assist feature. You obviously have some additional features like this reel is equipped with a jigging feature where the reel will go up and down on its own. I, I don't know, I don't use any of that. I free spool to the bottom, lock it up, okay? Step on the gas and it brings it up, that's it. The gauge. I don't use that gauge. I don't live and die by it. I use it as a reference. What do I mean by a reference? When I drop down in, we'll say 850 feet, that number is going to be somewhere around 325 to 350, somewhere in that ballpark. It may be a revolution, it may be a yard, it may be a meter, I don't care what it is. It's a number, okay? And when I'm bringing it back up, I have an auto stop feature, meaning that the reel is obviously going to stop before the rig hits the tip, the guide. It'll stop on its own, you can set that, okay? But we look at that number, so we obviously know how close or how, how far away from the surface that we are. And understand, when I say we fish with this under the arm, I don't wanna give you the wrong impression and imply that we are reeling every fish up. We're not. We're we're using the power assist feature, the electric feature on here, but we're holding the rod, okay? Because I want you to feel every head shake. I want you to feel the bite of that fish. I want you to feel it all. And that makes deep dropping very, very sporty. It changes the game. And there's another very big difference between how we deep drop and how my deep dropping has evolved into what most guys do. When we deep drop nowadays, and again, like everything else, you know, there's, you know, there's an evolution to everything, right? There's a graduation to everything. I'm sure somewhere on our streaming channel is a tile fish or a deep drop seminar that I did 10 years ago. And what I'm telling you today, I'm sure is 100% different than what I told you 10 years ago. Because again, everything evolves. The way we fish now is light and lighter, okay? Light and lighter. So light is in my hand right here. The rod is rated for 50 to 100 pound class, okay? We fish 50 pound braid on the Shimano Beastmaster 9000. The braid itself, the 50 pound diamond braid is connected to 30 feet of 100 pound Mamoy extra hard leader, 30 feet. Could be 50 feet, could be 25 feet. It's not the end of the world either way. Point I'm making is you have a top shot on top of the braid. Why? Because you need some elasticity, okay? Braid has no stretch. When you're bringing up a tile fish, whatever it is that you're bringing up, you're bringing that fish up from six, seven, eight, nine hundred feet of water 
You have a lead on the bottom that's spinning like a top. Okay? You have a fish that's spinning around the rig. You have a boat that's going up and down. So the boat's going up, pulling the hook. The boat comes down, and the lead pulls the hook in the other direction. So you're constantly wearing a hole in that fish's mouth. And if you had no stretch whatsoever, what's going to happen? You're going to pull hooks on a majority of the fish. So the mono is absolutely essential. Do not tie your braid directly to the rig. And this is the same, by the way, understand, on our lighter, we do exactly the same thing. It's that same 100 pound top shot, all, you know, 30 feet of it. Make sure you connect that to the braid. We use an Alberto knot. It's very, very small, very streamlined. There's no additional swivels and it goes easily in and out of the guides. Okay. At the end of that 100 pound is a small 150 pound class diamond ball bearing snap swivel. It's a very small snap swivel. Look, I don't need a 300 pound or a 500 pound clash giant snap swivel when I'm fishing 50 pound braid. It's about balance. Keep your entire outfit, your entire rig balanced from beginning to end. This 150 pound snap is not going to fail. I've never had one of these fail. If you buy one of the, you know, blue light special from Kmart or something, it might, but a quality snap, it's not going to fail. You have a drag on your reel. And we fish a relatively light drag because we're fishing relatively light line. On the end of the swivel is a very small light. Some people swear, no light, no bite. I tell you that sometimes we fish a light, sometimes we don't. It doesn't hurt. And at the end of the day, there's absolutely no way in the world for me or you to know if that light made a difference. If I caught a fish and I had a light on that rig, I caught the fish with the light. Would I have caught the fish without the light? How am I supposed to know? I caught it with the light, okay? Do I catch fish without lights? Absolutely, equally as many. So if I put two people side by side, and had one with a light and one without, there would be no difference. There would be no difference, okay? So I think it's, you know, again, it's a matter of choice. Nevertheless, the entire outfit, like I said, I'm stressing, is very, very light. This is the outfit, the one that's in my hand, that we use for the golden tilefish. The rod's a little bit stiffer, okay? A little bit stronger because we are fishing up to five pounds of lead. No more than five pounds. If I can't get away with five pounds of lead, something's wrong, okay? And I can get away with it, and let me explain why. When you go deep dropping, you drop your rig to the bottom, whatever the depth is, you lock up the rod, you put the rod maybe in the rod holder, depending on the size outfit that you're using. I doubt that you're holding it under your arm. And one thing that I'm sure of, or very likely, is that you're not in free spool and you're not feeding line out, okay? You're just dragging it. I'm not at all. I do not deep drop like that. I will take my rig, I'll drop it to the bottom. And as long as I have enough lead to get me to the bottom, that's all that matters. Because at that point, I'm not dragging it. I go into free spool and I'm feeding line out. Boat's drifting. I'm not holding the boat into the current. I'm not anchored. I don't have a drift sock out. I'm not powering into the current. I'm not using some, you know, electric trolling motor on the bow of my boat to slow me down or, no. I want to cover ground. I want to move. What I don't want to do is have to use eight to 10 pounds of lead and a really, really heavy rod and reel and lose the whole sport out of it. So by fishing in free spool, I can keep feeding that bait out and have substantially less lead. Now understand, this is not only one component, it's a system. That's why the Beastmaster is an ideal reel. Do you have any idea how many yards a 50 pound test are on this reel? Somebody take a guess. I heard 3,000, 5,000, and then I thought I heard somebody say a shit ton. Okay, <laughs> that would be the answer. Okay, there's a lot. You're not going to run out of line. I promise you that. You're not, and that's very important because we feed it out. My rig hit the bottom. 
It's sitting on the bottom. I want it to sit on the bottom because that's where they're feeding, that's where they're eating, right on the bottom. I'll feed it out, feed it out. And I don't mean just stay in free spool and go like this and put a ton of slack in the water. I mean a little bit at a time, depending on how fast the boat is drifting. And then every few minutes, I'm gonna tighten it up a little bit, get all of the slack out, stretch it out, and I promise you, you are going to know if you get a bite. You're gonna know if a one pound tile fish, a one pound blue line, you're gonna know if a one pound black belly rose fish is eating your bait even though you're in free spool, if you do it properly. Keep a relatively tight connection between here and the rig on the bottom. As I mentioned, if you have a tremendous amount of slack in the water, you're never gonna feel those bites. But if you have a straight connection to that rig, you're gonna feel every bite. And when I feel a bite, I don't just lock it up and slam on the gas. On the contrary, I give them more. I give them more. Because I know that the tile fish is not gonna go far away from his burrow. So I let him eat it. I let him eat it. He's chewing on it. I'm not pulling it away from him. Boom, boom, boom. He's eating it. I don't know how big that fish is. He might be 12, it might be a 12 pound golden tile or a 42 pound golden tile. I don't know that. All I know is something down there is eating my bait. That I know for sure. And I don't want to pull my rig away from him. So I'm going to feed it to him, feed it to him, feed it to him for you know, depending on the bite, it might be 10 seconds, it might be 30 seconds. And then I'm going to hold it again. And understand, the line is constantly between my fingertips, okay? This is how I'm fishing. So I feel everything. That diamond braid is so incredibly sensitive. Everything is so light and sensitive. It's incredible. And if I feel them again at that stage, I'm going to lock it up and I'm going to slowly start reeling. The first 30 seconds of that fight are the most challenging because now you have a fish. I don't care what size it is. I don't care if it's the blue line tile or the golden. He lives on the bottom. His whole life revolves on the bottom. He just ate a bait. He's hooked. You locked it up, okay, and you start reeling and you're pulling on him this way. The boat's drifting this way and suddenly he's going, wait a minute, home is over there. So he's going to do everything he can do at that moment not to come off the bottom. He's not voluntarily going to come off the bottom. So if you immediately go into full speed, if you slam on the gas, as I call it, okay, you're going to generally rip the hook right out of him, especially if it's a big fish. Slow, finesse. Okay, finesse. I cannot stress this enough, even though you're fishing with incredibly strong gear, with incredibly strong tackle, incredibly strong line and leader and hooks, and you're targeting an incredibly strong fish, you have to employ a level of finesse. This is finesse fishing, if you want to be good at it. If you want to catch big fish with light tackle, it's about finesse. It's understanding everything that's happening with your rig, situational awareness. So again, we get bit, we lock it up, we slowly start cranking. I crank by hand. I recommend cranking by hand until you really determine, oh man, this is a good one. This is a good one. You're going to know instantly. The rod's going to go whoop, and you're going to feel the weight of that fish. Now, there are many times, many times where we're deep dropping and understand we fish at least minimum two rods, sometimes four, generally two. Okay, all depends on the conditions. If the conditions allow us to have our lines coming right off the side of the boat, we got one up in the bow, one in the middle, and one in the stern. Three people fishing. If the lines are you know, going off the bow because of the wind and the current and the angle of everything, then maybe we'll only fish two. But we're always fishing at least two, no matter what. So there are plenty of times where we'll hook a big fish, I'll put the boat in gear, and I'm driving into the current. Okay, because I want to reduce that pressure between me and the fish. I want to reduce that pressure in the beginning of that fight. He doesn't want to come off the bottom. And if I don't reduce some of that pressure, I'm going to, something's going to go wrong. Something's going to fail, and I very likely will lose that fish. So don't be afraid to do that, but talk it through with your crew. Anybody who comes deep dropping with me before we ever drop a bait, heck, before we even ever leave the dock, 
We sit right there at the dock and I explain in detail, this is what we're doing, this is how we're gonna do it, this is what's gonna happen if this happens, this is what's gonna happen if this happens. Be prepared. If he hooks a big fish up in the bow and you're in the stern, understand I may put the boat in gear to go up and reduce some pressure, so you need to understand what I'm doing. And you may need to maneuver around the boat, which is one reason the power cords that come with these reels are typically six to eight feet or something like that. I extend them to 25 feet. All of my power cords are 25 feet. So you can plug in and you can move all around the boat. And if you had to unplug it to go over or under, which happens all of the time, I don't care who you are, I don't care how good you are at deep dropping, if you're fishing multiple rods, don't tell me you're not gonna cross every now and then. You're gonna cross. So there's going to be times when you need to unplug, take a rod, put it over another rod, under another rod, and then you simply plug back in and you're back in business. Your counter's at the same, you know, you didn't lose your spot in line, so to speak. So I highly recommend that you extend that cord. I've learned that, you know, the hard way, so to speak. Nevertheless, we hooked that big fish. We're now fighting them on much lighter tackle than we traditionally would. And even though we're targeting the golden tile fish, in, in this you know, particular conversation that we're having, I'm now down in the keys, and I can tell you every single time I drop to the bottom, you don't know what's going to eat your bait. Okay, You don't know what's going to eat your bait. And even though I want to catch tile fish, I'll tell you what, when I bring up that 40-pound yellow edge grouper, I'm not disappointed. When I bring up that big old snowy grouper, I'm not throwing them back, okay? I'm not upset about it. So you just never know. Barrel fish, queen snappers, there's all sorts of stuff down there that'll eat the baits. Big blackfin tunas, okay? Something totally unexpected. 800, 900 feet down, you get a great bite, your thing's fighting like crazy, and it's a 30-pound blackfin. And you're saying to yourself, this is the last thing in the world I ever expected to catch on the bottom. But they feed down there, okay? They feed down there. So getting back to it, light. That's one of the things I definitely want you to take away from this is going light. However, understand that even this outfit, remember I said we fish light and lighter. This was light, a 50 to 100 pound class rod, the Beastmaster, 50 pound line, the 100 pound top shot. That's as light, that, that's as light as I would recommend for the Goldens. Um, when you're fishing out here in this sort of current, 800, 900 feet, that's as light as I would recommend. However, we then built an even lighter rod, something even more sensitive, okay? And this is essentially the same rod, the same outfit as you can see. It's a little bit longer and a little bit softer. 40 to 60 pound class rather than 50 to 100. The reel's loaded with 40 pound braid, and we fish two pounds of lead, okay, two pounds. All I need is enough lead to get to the bottom. And I'm telling you, I don't care if that current is one knot, one and a half knots, two knots, two and a half knots, three knots, 3.3 knots, okay, where it's screaming, okay, and because we get all sorts of different conditions. This will work, this technique works in all of those circumstances because you are not dragging the rig. You can get away with two or three pounds of lead in 90% of the applications that you're deep dropping as long as you're in free spool and you're feeding it out. And trust me when I tell you, if we had 3,000 yards of 50 pound braid and that was, excuse my language, a shit ton, this is a shit ton ton with 40 pound because there's even more line on here and that's, I can't stress how important that is because it allows us to drift and drift and drift and drift and feed out and feed out. We'll go all the way down a half a spool. Okay, we don't get bit in a half a spool, then I'll put it in a rod holder, full speed, and let it come up on its own. Okay, and then it doesn't take very long. These reels are incredibly fast. Today's power assist reels are faster than anything we've ever seen before. And I believe the fastest is like those hooker electrics on, you know, when you put it on a little Tiagra, those things are, I, I, I don't know how many miles an hour or whatever it is, but fast, really fast. So we fish very light, okay? The rig itself, 
Look, there are a lot of different deep drop rigs on the market that are sold pre-made, okay? I'm once again explaining to you that over the years, I've tried it all and I've since evolved my rig into something that is deadly effective and very, very simple and very durable. And I say durable because it's very easy for a deep drop rig to get tangled. Anybody ever tangle a deep drop rig where the rig comes up looking like this? Okay, it happens to all of us. The rigs spin, they twist, and the more time that you're dealing with tackle failure, the less fish you're gonna catch and the less efficient you are. Okay, that's the bottom line. So my rig that I fish now, down in the Keys, and even here, if I was fishing here, would be the same. It's approximately six to eight feet long, the trunk line itself, and the main line is called the trunk line. So from top to bottom, you can see this one's about seven feet. It's 150 pound leader material, Mamoy Extra Hard Leader. So we have 50 pound braid, 100 pound top shot, 150 pound on the rig. The trunk and the branches are the same, 150. Top of the leader is a very small loop, which is crimped. Everything is very clean, very simple. There are no tag ends. If you're afraid of crimping, you shouldn't be. It's very, very easy and very reliable. Just get the appropriate size crimps, the appropriate crimping tool, and you put the little sleeve in the right size hole and you squeeze. We could all do that. And that connection is bulletproof. We then put on little swivel sleeves. Some people call them crane swivels that basically just slides on the line. There are different ways to do this. One way is with this crane swivel. Another way is with a basic barrel swivel and a couple of crimps. I don't care how you do it. The point is, is that this branch needs to be coming off the trunk line and fixed into position. So this is the top of the rig and that's my top hook right there. Remember where my hand is here is where my light is going to be attached, right? And there's my first rig, about an 18 inch leader, 9-0 VMC circle hook. If the fish is not big enough to get this hook in its mouth, it's not big enough for me to catch, okay? And I don't want to catch it. And I promise you that even a two or three pound blue line tile can get that hook in its mouth, okay? Weed out all of the small stuff. Then as you work your way down, there's a middle hook right there. And then finally, there's a bottom hook, okay, which is very close. You'll see here's my swivel. And guess what? That swivel's 150 pound. It's the same strength. It's the same swivel that's on the end of my leader. And then there's my final branch, like I said, just off my lead. And remember what I mentioned earlier. It is absolutely essential that you put these swivels on these rigs because literally your lead's gonna be doing that. The entire way down, the entire way up, it will, be it will be spinning. And if you don't have these swivels, your entire rig will be destroyed. This rig happens to be one in particular that we've been fishing regularly. The last two trips I fished this rig the entire time. It's beat up, you can see this one thing is all wrinkled up and beat up, but it works perfect, okay? And when the rig, gets destroyed either because a shark cut you off or it got chafed or whatever happened, cut the hooks off, cut the swivel off up on top and on, or on the bottom, I should say, that's holding the lead. And then all you need is some swivel sleeves, some crimps and some leader material and you can retie your rig, okay? Do not go out there with one rig. Go out there with 10. Hope that you never lose one. But there are going to be days when you lose rigs, various reasons. Sometimes you get tangled in the bottom, but not a lot, and I'll explain why. Remember what I said, we drop our rig to the bottom. We're feeding out line. I'm not dragging it across the bottom. If I drag it across the bottom, what's gonna happen? I'm very likely, or potentially, could get snagged. So I'm not dragging it across the bottom. I'm letting it sit, let it sit, let it sit. If I don't get bit in three to five minutes, I'm gonna lock it up. I'm gonna retrieve 50 feet of line, 50 feet of line approximately, and then I'm gonna go back into free spool. 
my rig now came off the bottom completely. It's off the bottom. And boom, free spool. And now it dropped in a completely different location, in a different spot. And now I'm going to let it sit right there. If you want to catch tilefish, this is how you need to do it. And then I drop it right there and I let it sit right there for three to five minutes. And I try and get a bite right there. If that doesn't work, again, I retrieve it, drop it again. So essentially I'm hopping my rigs across the bottom. Okay? But when they're on the bottom, they're not being dragged across the bottom. That's one way to avoid getting hung up. If you were targeting barrel fish or queen snapper, we retrieve our rig up off the bottom. A lot of times those fish will eat the baits off the bottom. The tile fish will not. The tile fish want that bait right on the bottom. We talked about squid okay, being the number one bait, and it, it, it is. It's, it's readily available. I could tell you I'm not going deep dropping without 20 pounds of squid. Okay, I get four five pound boxes. Am I gonna use all 20 pounds when I'm out there deep dropping? Absolutely not. But you know why I bring 20 pounds of squid? Because I would say here, 50% of the, t well, nowadays I would say here probably 25% of the time, and down in the Keys 50% of the time, dolphin show up, dolphin show up because you're out there, you're in dolphin territory. So to have a bucket of thawed squid that you can immediately throw some squid out at dolphin will keep them around the boat and will give you an opportunity to complement your deep drop catch with some dolphin. Who likes to catch dolphin? Okay, we all do. So why not take advantage of that? That's also why we'll take a Chaos 7 foot, 15 to 30 pound class spinning rod Match to, you could put a, a Shimano Twin Power, a Stella. This is a Saragossa. It's really all that you need. And we'll fish a spinner up off the bow and a spinner off the stern. Every time we go set up for a drift, we throw out a squid, we throw out a squid. The same squid that we're fishing on the bottom. And we just dead stick them right out of rod holders. And half the time, at some point, the rod doubles over because a bunch of, you know, schooly dolphins showed up, and then you can throw the squid and obviously keep them around the boat and catch them. But in addition to squid, these bigger fish, they love the meat, okay? They like meat. I don't care what it is. What I do on all of my deep drop trips is I stop on the way out on some local wrecks and we jig. And I don't care if it's Bonitas, Almaco Jacks, Amber Jacks, anything, Kingfish, any blue runners, anything that eats that jig, barracudas, is fresh meat. And that is an absolute huge advantage when you go out there targeting the golden tilefish and a lot of these other, you know, highly prized bottom fish. Another great bait here is those black belly rosefish that we talked about that are so abundant, okay, fillet those things and put on a big fillet right on the hook and drop that to the bottom along with squid. That makes an absolutely ideal tilefish bait. Now, going back to my rig for a second, one thing you won't see on here, you can see, is any glow beads, any glow skirts, any glow squid. There's nothing. It is very, very clean and streamlined because the more that I put on this rig, the more resistance that it creates. And the more resistance that it creates, typically, the more lead that you're going to need in order to maintain that natural presentation. Avoid all of that. Do you think all of the food that the tile fish that are down there eating is glowing? Okay. Do, they don't need help. They can find this food. They have phenomenal eyesight, phenomenal sense of smell. Okay. They can find the food. They can sniff it out. So by having that rig in three baits, three nice, juicy, smelly baits sitting in one spot, gives, there's a lot of scent, a lot of odor right there that they could zero in on. And then as I mentioned, you don't get a bite, hop it. So a lot of these tips and tactics that I'm sharing with you are stuff that I've learned down in the Keys or that I've evolved to because when I fished up here, we, we targeted those blue line tile fish, we did really well with them. Then we moved offshore for the golden tile fish. We did really well with them, especially in the areas where I'm telling you. And look, 
Guys catch them off Fort Lauderdale. Guys catch them up off Palm Beach. The golden tiles are out there. You just got to, you know, put in the time, right? But then I moved down to the Keys, and also I wanted to get into the deep dropping. And, of course, now I've got this technology. I have Seymour and this, you know, sophisticated Furuno chart plotters and multiple different chart options and you're really able to decipher and to you know really get a good close look at the bottom before you ever even leave the dock and that's what i did i studied it all studied it all studied it all and there's so much structure down in the keys it's incredible and if you ask me if i would ever deep drop up here ever again the answer is no way so if you own a boat put it on a trailer and get down to the keys Okay, or at least run down there in your boat, whatever. It makes that big of a difference. Why? Because of the habitat. There's just so much ideal habitat and so much ideal forage. Okay, and when you have that forage and that habitat, that can only result in great fishing. So I went down there and started deep dropping and learned that there's a wide variety of different options down in the Keys. And understand I'm in the Middle Keys, I'm in Marathon. But everything I'm telling you is applicable from Key Largo to Key West. And even in the Gulf, you know, that's a different fishery, right? Because in the Gulf, to get to deep water, you got to go out to Pulley Ridge in the areas we talked about before, which are typically 100 plus miles from shore. On the Atlantic side of the Keys, getting to prime deep drop territory is 12 to 18 miles. It's a hop, skip, and jump is really all it is with today's go fast boats, you know, it, nothing to get out 15 to 18 miles, 20 miles, it's nothing. So there's so much good bottom and how you fish there is exactly what I just mentioned to you. However, we primarily, we don't even go with the heavy stuff. When I'm looking for the tile fish, the blue line tile fish, this is my outfit right here. This is my choice, the 40 pound, little bit of a softer tip, the three hook rig, feeding it out, drop anywhere 600 to 650 on the shallow side to 800 on the deeper side. And if you put in the time, I promise you, you're going to find the tile fish. What really surprised me and continues to surprise me is the size of the blue line tile fish. We don't catch those little babies that we were catching up here. We've recently encountered some tile fish down there that I never even knew blue line tile fish got this big. Fish that are 30 inches, 33 inches. We had one two days ago that was 33 inches. You know, I'm like, that could just be an all tackle record. 20 pound blue line tile fish. If you follow my Instagram, you've seen them. If not, I highly recommend that you do. And you could see them with your own eyes. We post pictures of them. They're absolutely massive. These giant blue line tile fish. And what's even better is mixed in with these blue line tile fish are big giant yellow edge groupers, snowy groupers. So you've got some really phenomenal deep drop fishing down there. And we've learned to adjust to the conditions because look, I don't care what kind of boat you have, what kind of tackle you have, there are a couple of things that we can't control. We can't control mother nature. And when I say that, I mean the color of the water, how windy it is, the sea conditions, the current, you know, stuff that is just completely out of our control. We can't control that. And we can't control the fish. We can't control if the fish are gonna be there. And if they are there, are they gonna bite? Okay, we can't control that because just because they're there doesn't mean they're gonna bite. And you know how I know that? How many, Okay. okay. How many tile fish we've caught over the years that have been empty, empty, very, very rarely is there anything inside a tile fish's stomach? And I ch trust me, I, I check the stomach contents of every single fish that I catch. It's just fascinating to me. And they're empty. Here, sometimes they had these little eels in them and they have this little yellow, anybody catch blue line tile fish here and they have that little yellow spongy material in their stomach? 
Okay, you'll see it if you go out here and target these blue line tile fish enough, you'll see that they have this yellow spongy material in their stomach. Almost looks like an egg sac, you know, but much more firm. And I'm just not certain what it is. However, down in the Keys, all of the tile fish that we catch are just empty. There's nothing in their stomachs. So I have to think about that and go, do these fish have no food down here? Of course they do, they have plenty of food. But I really believe that a tile fish's metabolism and their behavior is not like a dolphin or a bluefish or a kingfish that's just constantly eating. That fish eats and he's got to digest his entire meal before he eats again. What other explanation is there on why you can catch all of these big tiles and they're empty? You know, very, very strange. The groupers, on the other hand, they'll have different stuff in them, especially crabs. They love crabs, which also tells me that when I'm drifting across the bottom and we're catching tile fish and grouper mixed in, that there's some sort of low-lying structure. Because spider crabs do not just walk across the sea floor out in the open. They don't. They live amongst the rock. They've evolved to look like rock. Okay, and they live amongst the low-lying reef and rock. And the groupers eat them up all of the time. That's probably the primary forage for the groupers offshore is crabs and crustaceans. The tilefish, we don't see the crabs in them. We don't see squid in them. I don't see anything in them. So it's almost like a little bit of a mystery. But yet, they'll eat the squid. They'll eat any sort of meat that you put on the hook, especially, like I said, if it's fresh. And by the way, one of the best baits that we have found is fresh dolphin. Fresh dolphin. So when you're offshore, if you catch a dolphin, sacrifice that. I mean, granted, if it's 30, 40 pounds, don't sacrifice it. But if it's, you know, 22 inches, 24 inches, you can get some prime baits out of that dolphin. Oftentimes, too, we'll actually try to avoid the tilefish. And I know this is a tilefish seminar, but you can only keep three fish per person, okay, of any combination. So if you have three people on, I just had a group, we had three people on the boat, okay? That's nine fish. Well, if seven of those nine are big tile fish, you don't want to catch any more tile fish because the other two are groupers, you have your limit, so now you're just trying to really just catch grouper and maybe sacrifice a small tile or the smallest one for bait, and we'll fish big baits will completely avoid anything that a, that a smaller tile fish could get in its mouth. And surprisingly, by doing that, that's how we've caught these really big tile fish, because they eat the really big baits. So kind of just an interesting little tidbit. What we've also found is that the larger gray tiles are on the deeper end of the spectrum. So if the gray tile fish have that habitat of 500 to 800 feet, the 750 to 800 is where the largest tile fish, the blue lines, are going to roam. As far as the goldens, we catch those throughout their realm, 800 to 1200, and anywhere in that area, you could pick off the bigger golden tile fish. Okay, couple things I want to mention that are you know really really important: the tackle. You know, we've talked a lot about it. There's a lot of variation. Nowadays, it's hard to get your hands on these particular reels. That doesn't mean you shouldn't go deep dropping. There are other options, and I'm sure the crew here at Chaos would be happy to outfit you with something other than these, if need be. Okay? If you can't get your hands on the Beastmasters, like I said, there's other options. The rods, they have to be Chaos rods. That's number one. Okay? They have to be. Otherwise, just don't even go. You're not going to catch anything. The line, the diamond braid, essential. Don't think to yourself, I got to fish 80 pounds, 65 pounds. No, we're fishing 65 and 80 for swordfish. Okay, for swordfish, that could be 500 plus pounds. You're fishing for fish, that best case scenario. Your, your fish of a lifetime off the bottom might be 50. A giant 50 pound snowy, okay, which is once in a lifetime. Okay, so you don't need anything more than the 40 or 50. 
just make sure it's in good shape because braid is susceptible to damage. If you lean the rod up against a concrete seawall, if any of that braid gets damaged, you're going to create a weak link because remember, braid, the word braid, that's not one line. That's eight individual strands that are braided together. One of those strands gets damaged, you now have a weak point. And, it, and that weak point will fail. So I don't use these, like a lot of guys will have electric reels that they'll use kite fishing, and then they'll modify you know, what, what tackle is on the reel, and they'll use them deep dropping, and they'll go back and forth. These are dedicated deep drop rods. They don't see use with anything else, okay? Because I don't want to damage that. Make sure your connections are bulletproof. I say this with every seminar, and I'm going to drill it into your head. Okay, because no matter how good we are, no matter how good we take care of our gear, we're still going to lose some fish. We're still going to miss some fish. We're going to lose some fish. We're not going to be successful every time. So in order to increase our score, to increase our ratio, we have to control everything that we can control. This way, the uncontrollables We'll deal with that as it happens, but we have to control everything that we can. So tackle is essential. Before every single trip, inspect your gear, make sure that it's perfect. If it's not, don't waste your time running 20 miles offshore. You know, it's expensive stuff. It's a lot of fuel, a lot of time. And the last thing you want to do is lose a quality fish. The bait we talked about, squid. If it's the small squid or even big squid that you can cut in half, rip the head off, put that on a hook, put the body on a hook. When I'm fishing a three hook rig, I like to mix it up. I'll put squid on the top, a big piece of meat in the middle, squid on the bottom, or two pieces of meat. You know, and again, when I refer to meat, I'm talking about a very big streamlined strip of something. Okay, and it's got to be streamlined because that rig is dropping to the bottom. 800 or so feet, and anything that spins and that really isn't natural potentially could tangle the entire rig. Finesse, we talked about. I have to drill that into your head again. Finesse. Understand what's happening and handle it smoothly and accordingly. Do not go out there and try and manhandle these fish, okay? Go out there with a level of finesse and always have situational awareness. Stop thinking that the ocean is flat, okay? The surface is just water everywhere and it all looks the same. And when I bring people deep dropping, we do deep drop courses, and I make it a point when we're out there. I say to everybody, I go, what do you see? And they say, and they look at me, they go, what? I go, what do you see? And they all do the exact same thing. A lot of water. I see water everywhere, everywhere. Well, of course, we all see that. But stop looking at just the surface and start picturing the bottom. Think about the bottom, okay? What does that bottom look like in relation to where you are? Is it sloping? Is it flat? Where are the drop-offs in relation to where you are? There's one in particular stretch that I'm fishing now. Last few trips, I've been on a hot streak in this one area. But it drops off about 40 feet. So you'll drift for about two miles, and then there's a 40-foot drop. As soon as it drops, you could just reel them up and, get, and go back up because you don't get any bites after it drops. Only 40 feet, that, which, you know, when you're, when you're in hundreds and hundreds of feet of water, 40 feet doesn't seem very significant. But it's a combination of different factors that for some reason, all of the fish are up on the plateau and not on the drop off. So I'm constantly paying very close attention to where I am. I have situational awareness. And when I get to, or just when we pass that drop off, I go back up okay, for another drift. Again, it's just really having a good understanding of the territory. Understand the fish, the behavior of the fish. Blue line tile fish will live to 15 or 16 years old. A monster is 10 plus pounds. Our gargantuan, or like some of the ones that we've been catching recently, which I don't even know where they're coming from, but they're just massive. The golden tile fish will live to 40 years old. They're very slow growing fish. 
It's not like a pelagic predator that's always moving. And when you're always moving, you're burning a lot of energy. And when you're burning a lot of energy, you need a lot of fuel. Okay, and you could follow that cycle. These fish, on the other hand, as I mentioned, they live in one small area. Their whole life could be in an area smaller than this entire area right here. If there's a pothole right in the center, there could be a 30 pound golden tile fish right there, and this is his world. Nothing more, nothing less for 30 years. Okay, so understand that. Understand that their feeding behavior, they never feed at night. They never feed at night. Don't ask me why, we've, we've tried. We can never ever catch a tile fish, either golden or blue line, in the dark. Never, I don't know why. As soon as it gets, you know, like the sun gets over the horizon and it gets dark, the bite shuts down completely. They shut down at night. They only feed during the day. Also understand that even though they're down there that deep, do not think that they can't see anything because even though it is dark, pitch black, ice cold, 40 to 50 degrees, 800 feet down, they can still see. They know when it's daytime and nighttime. Okay, they can see. They know when it's sunny and when it's cloudy. And I've also found that the deep drop fishing is always better when it's sunny. Okay, it's always better. And I um, believe logic would say because it's sunny, more light is penetrating that depth, you know, that, that deep water, those dark depths. Because it's sunny, more light is penetrating down there and allowing them to feed more efficiently, I'm assuming, okay? You know, there are some things that we'll just never know. You know, we, we can't be inside the brain of a fish. Maybe one day in the future, Elon Musk will figure that one out. Okay, wouldn't surprise me. But up until today, we don't know that. So we have to make assumptions based on time spent on the water, what we see when we're out there. And it's all very fascinating. If you're not really fascinated with deep drop fishing, then you probably shouldn't do it. I, on the other hand, I'm like a little kid in a candy shop. Okay, I get super excited, super excited about every bite. When you're bringing the fish up, it's always a mystery. I believe I'm really good at, you know, not guessing, but, but assuming that that's what you hooked. You've got a grouper on, I could tell by the bite, or you've got a big golden tile fish, or whatever it may be. And I would say 90% of the time I'm right, and 10% is just a surprise. Okay, it's just a surprise. But it's always fascinating because I'm that guy that's looking like this. You know, always looking down, waiting to see that shadow emerge from the depths. Is it white? Is it brown? How bright is it? How big is it? Are there bubbles coming up? And also, whenever you're reeling up, here's another advantage to fishing the light tackle with the light lead. I could be fighting a fish, big fish, and three quarters of the way up, the pressure is reduced tremendously. Suddenly it feels like half the weight, half. Why is that? Okay, the fish got, has barotrauma, okay, he's bloated and he's now floating. Only happens to the big groupers. The tile fish will float too, but not like a grouper. A tile fish will come straight up, okay, straight up. You're reeling him up, he's whoop, straight up. A big grouper, your line's gonna be scoped out because the boat's still drifting. And the closer you get to the surface, the more of an angle your line is gonna have. And you're gonna see bubbles. And I love to see bubbles. When I see bubbles, I say fish are farting, but it's not fish farts, okay? When you see bubbles, that's a big grouper floating up. And he's literally has so much buoyancy that he's dragging that lead to the surface. A tile fish doesn't have that much buoyancy. It can't do it. So anytime that angle comes out and that fish is floating up, that's clearly an indication that it's a big grouper versus a tile fish. The golden tile fish are the same. They don't bloat like a grouper does. So you typically can tell that it's a golden. And you know, I know I'm all over the place and I'm talking about a lot of different things. That's because that's what deep dropping is. You know, you can have a target species in mind, but you just never know what you're gonna encounter when you're out there. And 
even though we do find a lot of groupers mixed in with the blue line tilefish, we don't find a lot of groupers mixed in with the golden tilefish. What we do find with the golden tilefish down in the Keys often are barrel fish, but that's a different seminar altogether. So be prepared, okay? Time of the year, look, it's gotta be open season. It doesn't make sense to go deep dropping if the season's closed, because every fish that you bring up to the surface is gonna die. We carry a descending device. By law, you have to carry a descending device with at least 60 feet of rope. I can tell you we have tried, and will continue to try, to release these fish back unharmed, but I promise you it is not gonna survive, okay? Half of its internal organs are out of its butt. I'm sorry to say it that way, but that's the truth. Okay, the fish has barotrauma. His eyes have bugged out. His intestines have come out of every orifice in its body. He's done. He's toast. Don't tell me if I descend that fish 60 feet down, he's suddenly going to go, whoop, thanks, bye, whoop, and swim away. Yeah. Not going to happen. Okay, it's not. It's shark food. That's what it is. Yeah. So, you know, yes, you have to release them. I get it. But remember what I'm saying. It just doesn't make sense to target these species during closed seasons. Right now, tilefish is open, you know, blue line tilefish, May, June, July, August. But that's until South Atlantic Fisheries Management Council says, hey, the quota is going to be filled, we're shutting down the fishery early. Happens every year. Last year, if I remember right, it's supposed to be open May, June, July, August, and I think it was early July when they close the blue line tile fish. And you can't keep any of them. And then the snowies, snowy grouper was closed too, but they left yellow edge open. But the yellow edge live with the snowies and the blue lines. So to target the yellow edge grouper, you have to fish in the same exact area and 95% of what you catch is not the target species that you have to release. So during that time of the year, we don't fish for the deep water tile fish and the groupers. Instead, we deep drop for the queen snappers and the barrel fish because that's open. Okay, so like I said, fish the seasons. Honestly, you know, the one thing I mentioned earlier when I said would I ever deep drop here again? No. You know, I really genuinely have to stress that. I've experienced both fisheries here and in the Keys, of course, and in the Gulf, but I'm, I'm putting that separate because of the 100 plus mile journey. I would never deep drop up here again. Where we are down there in the Keys is such a target rich environment. It, it really just doesn't make, you know, I don't wanna say it doesn't make sense. You know, you're here, right? So certainly, this is the water that you have access to. These are the fish that you have access to. But at the end of the day, if you have access to this, we're not talking about another country. We're talking about 50 to 100 miles. You're going to the Bahamas. Half the people go to the Bahamas all of the time. You know, that's 50 to 100 miles. Go that way, not that way. People say to me, oh, you go to the Bahamas a lot. I'm like, not since I moved to the Keys. I don't. I'm, I have better fishing down there than I did over there. The only thing better over there than down there is the yellowfin tuna fishing. And unfortunately, that's not that great either because last time we were there, we hooked 12 yellowfins and landed two. Guess who got the other 10? Taxman. Okay? And not that we don't have that problem, we do with the muttons on the wrecks, but we don't have that problem offshore. The guys that are fishing the humps for the blackfin tuna, they have that problem. Once again, that's a different seminar. But for the bottom fishing, for the deep dropping, it's unrivaled. And it's, and I don't, you know, you don't have to go as far down as the lower keys. Even Key Largo, that whole area is excellent deep dropping. You know, make a day out of it, go down there, do whatever you're gonna do. The bait, the tackle, really important. Next, I wanna just touch real quickly on jigging. Jigging these fish, you know, deep water jigging because just like the blue line tile fish here, we eventually graduated to jigging the fish. We talked about that earlier in the seminar. Well, the same, in order to constantly graduate, in order to sportier, lighter, more fun, more exciting, more challenging, you know, that's where I'm at. I feel like my fishing career right now, after fishing for 48 years, 
If it, is it, if it isn't really challenging, it just doesn't interest me. Okay? I like to consider myself a trophy hunter, and every single time that I go out, I'm hunting for a trophy. Does it always happen? No. But that's why they call it trophy hunting. You don't always get these big old trophies, but it'll never happen if you don't try. And then as you continue to evolve as an angler, you just want your challenges to increase because with every increase in challenge comes an equal increase in reward. You know, that's the bottom line. So jigging these fish has really become just an awesome challenge, but it requires some very, very specialized equipment. And also understand, we do not go out, I don't go out and say, hey, I'm going to run 20 miles and I'm going to jig for tile fish and grouper the whole time. No, 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 no. I'm going out deep dropping and when I do a drift and we're catching them, now I grab my jig rod. I don't want to drop that jig 800 feet down unless I know there are fish down there. Unless I know that there are targets down there and it's worthy. I got better things to do other than to drop a jig, work it 800 feet and reel it back up. So I, we only whip out the jig rods when we're catching them on the bait, okay? And then as we know, okay, the fish are there, we're in a hot area, we found a stretch of fish, now we increase the challenge by jigging. What I have found with this deep water jigging is all of the rods that we were using to jig shallower just weren't heavy enough, okay? They weren't strong enough, you know, they were rated for up to, let's just say, 300 gram, 350, even 400 gram jigs, but they were too soft, too parabolic, and then matched to something like an Oshia Jigger 2000, I didn't have enough line in 900 feet, and I didn't have enough torque, enough winching power. So we stepped it up, and after a wide variety of different uh, prototype blanks and different you know, concepts, we ultimately built a series of rods that I believe are just absolutely perfect for deep water jigging. And understand that I'm gonna call this slow jigging, I'm not gonna call it slow pitch jigging. Because there are guys that are slow pitch enthusiasts that will tell you that you have to hold the rod a certain way and do a certain thing, no. Oh, I, let me rephrase that, I don't wanna say no. That's great and dandy for them, but that's not what is absolutely necessary to be successful. What I like to say is all you have to do is move the jig, just move it slowly, okay? Move the jig slowly. So how do you do that? The rod itself, first of all, seven foot needs to be a little bit longer because we're sweeping the rod, okay? And because we have 800 plus feet of line out, if the rod was shorter, your arc would be shorter. And if your arc is shorter, by the time that's translated all the way down the line to the jig, the jig barely moves. So by having a rod that was specifically built to be a foot longer, my arch is much longer. And ultimately, I get more movement to the jig. The rod is incredibly light. It is a carbon fiber rod or gra I don't even know what super space age material this is made out of, but it is incredibly light and incredibly comfortable. The guides are acid wrapped or spiral wrapped. That's what it's called, you can call it either. You can see that they start up on top and they end on the bottom. Why is that? Couple of reasons. Number one, it prevents the rod from twisting in your hand when you're fighting a fish, but more importantly, when you're working and sweeping that jig, if the guide was on the top, and I'm going to turn the rod upside down for a moment. If the guide was on the top, every time you swept that up, you risk the line wrapping up on the rod tip because it catches on the guide all of the time. So by bringing those guides to the bottom of the rod, you can see the line now just will slide off the top of the blank and you don't get tangled. That's you know, really one of the biggest advantages. Another advantage is when you, you know, apply pressure and you load the rod, no matter how loaded the rod is, the braid itself will never touch the blank. And remember, we're trying to protect our braid. Our braid is very fragile. And in this case, 20 pound braid. We're fishing ultra deep water with ultra thin line, 20 pound test, nothing more. 
because we want that diameter to be as thin as possible in order to have the least amount of resistance, which will allow us to have the greatest sensitivity with the lightest jig possible. Again, it's a system. The entire reel is loaded with 20 pound diamond braid. In this particular case, this is called yard line. It is absolutely not necessary. I know when I'm on the bottom, not from the line, but from the jig hitting the bottom. That's how I know I'm on the bottom. And when I'm jigging deep water tile fishing grouper, I don't care about what's in the middle of the water column or 100 feet off the bottom. I care about the bottom 10 to 15 feet, nothing more. I want my jig to be on or near the bottom. The line itself, the braid is connected to a monofilament or a fluorocarbon top shot, 40 pound test, 20 feet is plenty. Same Alberto knot. The reel is perhaps the most vital part of this entire equation. This is an Oshia Jigger 4000. It is, in my opinion, the most technically advanced tool when it comes to jigging that I've ever held in my hand. What's most important about this reel is the torque. It's got this massive handle, as you can see, with this massive T handle, and it has just this huge, we'll see, crank that you can literally just crank and crank, but it's got so much torque that you don't feel the weight of that 500 gram jig. That's nearly two pounds, two pounds. So I'm working a two pound jig, 800 to 1,000 feet below the surface. When I need to reel that back up to the boat, I need, the, I need as much torque as possible. And understand when you're deep water jigging, when you're retrieving that jig, I, here's what I want you to do. I don't want you to try and reel it up as fast as you possibly can because by the time you're 100 or 200 feet off the bottom, you're going to be like, oh my God, oh, my arm is killing me. Forget this. Give me the electric reel. Okay, that's what you're going to be saying. Instead, find a rhythm, find a slow pace because this is a very fast reel. Okay, very, very fast. And with every crank, with every revolution, I'm gaining well over a yard of line with every revolution. So as long as I find a nice, steady rhythm, nice, steady rhythm, you'd be surprised how quickly you can reel up a jig off the bottom. Now, the reason I call it slow jigging, this happens to be one of my favorite deep water jigs. It's called an enforcer. Okay, you can see it has some glow but most importantly, and of course, some of that red, gold, bronze color. What does that look like? A squid. You know, if you took a live squid, not a dead squid, not the frozen stuff in the box in that freezer right there, because that's white, okay? It's dead, it's white, beige, whatever. That's not what a real squid, that's not the color of a real squid. That is the color of a real squid that's alive. It's red and vibrant and full of all of these little color changing particles and gold. And literally you can hold a real squid in your hand right next to this jig and it'll look identical. Not only in color, but in size, in the shape of the jig. And it's the primary forage that they're eating on or near the bottom. So what do I want to present on or near the bottom is a squid. And what doesn't eat squid? Everything on the bottom eats squid. So for me, it is the absolute ideal jig to fish the bottom. And because it has this crazy shape, you know, you can come up at the end and take a good look at it. It's got all of these different like contours and shapes. It has crazy movement. And all you have to do is just swing it, just move it a little bit, and it'll fall on its side, it'll dart off, it'll wobble, it'll dart off, it'll wobble, it'll pitch over here, just like a live squid, okay? It is the closest thing to, a, it's probably better than a live squid, okay? It really is. So that's what I would recommend, no additional terminal tackle. You can see I've got my 40-pound fluorocarbon tied right to the jig, there's no swivels, there's nothing else. We drop this down, hit the bottom, work it within the bottom 15 feet, no more, drop it back down. 15 feet, drop it back down. 15 feet, drop it back down, etc., etc. When you're scoped way far out, 
and you can no longer have a nice, clean, vertical presentation, then reel it all the way back up and drop it back down again. And depending on how fast the current is, you may be able to work that jig for five minutes or 15 minutes. Again, depending on the current. Ideally, we like to have, oh gosh, I would say no more than two knots of current when you're deep dropping. Makes for ideal conditions, but that isn't always the case. There's plenty of times when you have three plus knots. At three plus knots, I'm not jigging. I won't even touch the jig rod. I'm not, I know I'm not gonna get the presentation that I'm looking for, and I know that I'm practically wasting my time. Now, there are a lot of guys that are getting into deep water jigging and using power assist reels, smaller than this, right? There's all sorts of new electric reels that are a fraction of this size that allow you to deep drop, or I'm sorry, that allow you to jig manually, but they also have the power option. I personally don't lean in that direction. If I'm gonna jig, I'm gonna jig manually. If I'm gonna use power assist equipment like this, I'm gonna fish the bait. I don't mix the two. If you do, great. When it comes to power on the reels, remember what I said to you about extending the cords, okay? Do yourself a favor, extend those cords. There are external battery options nowadays. I think there's one called the real battery. Um, there may be another one out there where it's literally a portable battery. It's like smaller than a water bottle and you plug it into your reel. And you can either have it in a backpack, on a waist pack. You, I've seen some guys literally strap it right to the rod, literally kind of like this. I've had guys come on my boat and every single time anyone has come on my boat, the battery has died within a very short period of time. They've had multiple batteries. They kind of, they have to switch them out all of the time. I don't recommend the batteries. I like to plug in. I've got four outlets on my boat and I know once we're plugged in, I'm good. That's one less thing that I have to worry about. I have enough other things to worry about. I don't have to worry about if my battery dies, okay? And don't worry about these drawing your, your batteries low on your boat. They practically draw nothing. And most of the time our engines are running anyway. So they're constantly charging. We've never had an issue with even four people fishing simultaneously with it creating any sort of, you know, overpower, you know, uh, whatever it may be, any sort of power issue. So they just don't draw that much. But like I said, those batteries, it, my experience with them has never been great from what I've seen. Maybe, you know, other people are having better experience. I don't know. So at the end of the day, a lot of opportunity out there, not only on the tile fish, but don't forget about the dolphin that are out there. Don't forget about increasing the challenge and jigging on the bottom as well. But when it comes to those tile fish, from my experience over the last 25 years, the best blue line tile fishing I've ever seen, numbers wise, is way out in the Gulf. Quality wise, is off the keys. The Goldens, I've caught and seen more caught up here than anywhere else, anywhere. So you do have a phenomenal golden tile fishery out here that I'd highly suggest that you explore. And then finally, I'm gonna give you a recipe, my favorite recipe for tile fish, because I like to share everything from hooking them to cooking them. Take yourself a big old tile fish filet or a number of filets, season, salt, pepper, your favorite seasoning. Uh, take an iron skillet or any sort of deep baking dish shoot some Pam or something in there so it doesn't stick to it. Lay your fillets flat, then take a nice homemade crab meat stuffing, cover the whole top with a good inch, inch and a, you know, a good thick layer of crab meat stuffing. I like to make my crab meat stuffing with, of course, crab meat, breadcrumbs, and I use a little bit of mayo as a binder, you know, to mix, to hold it together. And that mayo is obviously made out of oil, so that oil is gonna dissipate through the fish Keep the fish real moist as it bakes. Bake it at 400 degrees for anywhere from, depending on the thickness of the filet, if it's you know really big tile fish, 30 to 40 minutes, small tile fish, 20 minutes, but bake it until that fish is done. You're gonna know all of that 
you know, oil, oil, oil and the juice is all going to be boiling and you'll get a nice crisp uh, top to the breadcrumbs. And I'll tell you what, that right there is absolutely delicious.